How shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. Jesus prayed to the Father, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we get started this evening, let's have a few moments of silent prayer. Scripture teaches that throughout all the ages, a believer must be cleansed of sin, either ritually in the Old Testament, actually in the Old Testament as well, and actually in the New Testament. And this is done through confession of sin. And when we confess our sin, it's simply a matter of admitting or acknowledging our sin to God the Father, not just that we're a sinner, but identifying, listening, naming, identifying the sins. And God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we'll have a few moments of silent prayer to give you the opportunity to make sure that you are in fellowship. Then I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, we're so grateful for all the grace that you have given toward us, all the many blessings that you have supplied us with, that you have given us everything we need for life and godliness. And Father, now as we come together this evening just to be encouraged and strengthened by your word, we pray that we might come to a greater understanding of of just the magnificence of your plan of salvation and all that you have done in order to provide for us and the tremendous sacrifice that Uh, was brought upon our Lord Jesus Christ and all of the suffering, both physical as well as spiritual, which far surpassed any of the physical suffering he endured, that we may come to a greater appreciation of all that has been accomplished for us and that we have therefore benefited and been given this salvation, not because of who we are or what we've done or any other factor, but just because of your love for us. Now, Father, we pray that as we study, we might be Continue to be mindful of the fact that what we read, what we study, has been written for our uh, spiritual edification, that we can come to know and understand all of these things, because no matter how they fit together, it all is important to our understanding of who you are and your word, and to think within a biblical framework. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 52, verse 13. Isaiah chapter 52, verse 13. We're taking a sidetrack into Isaiah because of the conversation that Philip has, uh, Philip had with the Ethiopian eunuch recorded in Acts chapter 8. In Acts chapter 8, Philip, who had been directed by first by an angel of God and then the Holy Spirit, approaches this Ethiopian eunuch who's riding on his way home, riding in a chariot, Uh, on the road to Gaza from Jerusalem. And as he comes up on um, on the the, uh, eunuch, he overhears him reading out loud in in the chariot. And he's reading from Isaiah chapter 53. And Philip asks him, do you understand what it is that you were reading? And the place where he was reading was from Isaiah chapter 53. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before its shear is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away, and who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask of you, of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or some other man? That is one of the most important questions to address in Isaiah 52, 13, down through 53, 12. Of whom is the prophet speaking? There have been uh, three basic suggestions historically. The first is that it's a historical figure. It's either talking about Isaiah, about himself, Elijah, Hezekiah, or some other prophet. Uh, Another option is the view that this refers to the nation or the people of Israel. And that is a view that you will hear if you are speaking to someone from a, a Jewish background who is trained uh, in, uh, in, in their beliefs. Uh, many Jews are not. They won't even know who Isaiah is, a lot like a lot of, uh, a lot of Christians don't know who Isaiah is. 
And, um, and this just is due to biblical illiteracy that is across the board in our, uh, in our culture. But a, someone that you're speaking with that is knowledgeable about rabbinic interpretation, modern rabbinic inter- interpretation, the view is that this refers to the national people of Israel. Now, there are problems, many problems with that view, not the least of which is that historically, until about 1000 A.D., uh, the rabbinical interpretation was that this was a messianic passage. They understood this to be speaking about an individual, that the servant in this passage was Messiah. Now, in other passages that I pointed out in previous studies, the servant refers to a number of different people in the book of Isaiah. There are places where the servant refers to Isaiah, places where the servant refers to David, places where the term servant refers to Israel. But in the last part here of, of Isaiah... It no longer refers to the people of Israel because they're no longer qualified because of their rebellion against God, because of their idolatry, because of the fact that that they have succumbed to the pagan beliefs of the cultures and the countries surrounding them. They are no longer righteous, and this is one of the qualities that we find of the of the servant in chapter uh, fifty three, verse eleven. The, the verse reads that by his knowledge, that is his, referring to the servant, my righteous servant shall justify many. So the servant is declared to be righteous, and yet just a few chapters from now in Isaiah uh, 64, I, the prophet Isaiah will say that all of us, uh, that, that, that none of us are righteous. All our works of righteousness are like filthy rags, referring to the entire nation, the people of Israel. So if the entire nation is unrighteous, how can the nation be the righteous servant? This is a major uh, problem that you, that you have with the interpretation of this servant as the nation Israel. There are others. And so the, that leaves us with the option, the third option, which is that this is a messianic prophecy and relates to a future deliverer from, from, uh, of Israel. Now, I've put this uh, uh, diagram, this outline, up on the screen in the past. And just to put it in your mind that there's an organization here that it begins with, uh, it's a chiasm. I'll go ahead and put that chart there with uh, the, the letter X there that marks the indention moving in, moving out. A, a, B, and C statement, then B prime, A prime. The, the first and last statements mirror each other. The B lines, B and B prime, mirror each other. And the middle C line is the focal point of this, uh, of this type of literary organization. Another thing you should note here is, as uh, I've talked about this in the past few weeks, it's always important whenever you're in a passage like this to be able to identify who the speakers are. And that's not always easy. You need to identify who's speaking, to whom are they speaking, to whom do these prepositions and pronouns, um, excuse me, to whom do these pronouns refer and these relative, uh, relative pronouns, who, um, whom, my, his, your, who's the referent there? And that's, that's important to understanding uh, a lot about the passage. As we look at this, and you may want to make a no- notation of this in your Bible, the speaker at the beginning in 52, 13 to 15 is God. Yahweh is the one speaking at the beginning, and Yahweh is the one who speaks at the end in verse 10, most likely, because there's a shift by the, at least the middle of verse 11 to, by his knowledge, my righteous servant. So once again, it's God by that point, but m- most believe, and it seems Likely that 10 is part of this. So 10, 11, and 12 are the conclusion. Sandwiched in between the opening and the closing, where God is the speaker, there is a report from 53, 1 through 9, a report from somebody. Now, it's important to identify who that somebody is. And I believe that because the verbs that we find in chapter 53, 1 through 9 are uh, for the most part, past 
tense verbs. The speaker is looking back on something that has happened in past time, and it's likely that the speaker here refers to future regenerate Jews, the future saved remnant who looks back historically on on what happened to the servant. And so this is their report between verse uh, 53, 1 through 9. So that sort of gives us the overview. And I want to go back just a minute and say a couple of more things about the first part of this as we get into this, the opening uh, section in 52, 13 through 15. There's some real tangled sort of exegetical things in here, nothing that will shake you, but they're the kinds of things that, from my perspective as a pastor, that I've got to work through some of these rather uh, uh, naughty little things to find out what the issues are and what's going on, and then try to boil that down so I can communicate it to you without uh, getting too mired in all of the weeds so that uh, none of us go away very, very satisfied. This... um, Opening section here starts with the um, focus on that really gives us an overview of what the passage, what this whole servant song is going to talk about. The focus here, I want you to understand, is on the exaltation and glorification of the servant. It's so often that we come to this whole passage. And we look at it as the suffering servant because there's so much in chapter 53 that talks about the substitutionary substitutionary suffering of the servant. But the focal point isn't really on his suffering. The focal point is on his exaltation and glorification. And so we see this in verse 12, rather verse 13, which is the um, uh, sort of a topical uh, sentence. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. That's the New King James. I don't think that's the best translation, as we'll see in a minute. Uh, it should be, my, my servant shall deal successfully, would be the best translation. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. What is that verse saying? It's saying that the, the servant is going to be successful and so successful that, as, that he will be exalted above everything. And that's, that sets the tone for this whole section. It's, the focus isn't on his suffering, but on his exaltation and glorification. Verse um, uh, 14 then reads, just as, many as, uh, just as many were astonished at you, so his visage was marred more than any man, and his form, form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths at him. For what had not been told them, they shall see. And what they had not heard, they shall consider. Now, this chart I thought would be somewhat interesting for everybody. I took, uh, I hope you can read it. I had to scrunch things in here a little bit. Uh, I'm going to break out subsequent charts where we just have one verse. But I wanted to put these three verses in column here in comparison. The column on the left is the New King James translation. The column in the middle is the Jewish Publication Society version of the Old Testament translation from 1917, and the column on the right is the Tanakh from 1985. The Tanakh is an acronym for T-N-K, T for Torah, N for Nevi'im, the prophets, and K for Ketavim, the writings, the three divisions of the Hebrew Scriptures. So this is the the JPS translation in the middle, the a little more modernized Tanakh uh, translation in 1985. Nobody here can accuse a Jewish translator of being ignorant of the Hebrew. I just want to make that clear from the outset, because you're going to see a couple of discrepancies here. Now notice what I've done is to underline where there are some, some uh, significant distinctions between the translations. In the first verse, uh, verse 13, we see in the left column that the New King James translates it, my servant shall deal prudently. And in verse 13, both the JPS and Tanakh translate it, my servant shall prosper. Uh, it's the same idea as I translate as having success. He will prosper. Prosper is the result of dealing wisely. 
And many times, as I pointed out, that verb that's used there is used not just for the initial act of being wise or dealing wisely or prudently with somebody, but the result of that, which is success or prosperity. So the JPS and the Tanakh translations there, I think, are, are, uh, are more aligned with some more modern uh, Christian English translations and I think are more accurate in their, in their rendering. And then basically all three agree in the second half of that verse that the servant will be exalted, extolled, be very high in the New King James, and the JPS lifted up and shall be very high, and in the Tanakh raised to great, uh, be exalted and raised to great heights. The idea is that he is elevated above everything. Then in verse 14, I want you to notice... Um, The New King James says, just as many were astonished. Now, astonished sort of communicates this idea of surprise. You're just, you're just taken aback a little bit and you're surprised. And, um, and then the JPS and Tanakh both, both translate that as, uh, many were appalled. I think they're much more accurate there in that word. That word is a word often used to describe the, the, the uh, result of observing God's terrible judgment on people. And so appalled is a much better translation of that, of that word than astonished. Astonished has too positive a, a nuance there. This is a very negative thing. They're just, they're just uh, appalled. They're devastated. It's, it's just uh, they can't fathom what has happened in terms of the judgment of God on this individual. The rest of the verse is very, very similar between the three. Then we come to the major difference we'll see in verse 15. Verse 15, the New King James translates it, so shall he sprinkle many nations. And the JPS and the Tanakh both translate that verb, so shall he startle many nations. Now, if you were to be involved in a discussion with somebody who was Jewish about Isaiah chapter 53, and you pulled out your Bible, and they pull out their Bible, you're going to sit there and go, uh-oh, their Bible says something different from mine. So now you're going to understand why their Bible says something different. But let's uh, work our way through this um, systematically. In verse 13, we have that opening sentence, as I've said already, from the, the verb there is sakal, which is a word that means to uh, act wisely, to be understanding and discerning, and as a result, to prosper. Uh, eight English words are used in the Old Testament to translate this verb. It sometimes means instruct, or to be prudent, to understand, to see, to make wise, to have success, or to act with insight or devotion. The focus in this verse is on acting wisely, that is, bringing about success, accomplishing what you intended to accomplish, bringing your mission to a positive conclusion. And the second line then explains uh, that that success is his exaltation. It parallels that. The second line uh, explains the result of that success is that he is exalted, elevated, up to heaven. So the theme, this is the theme verse for this whole section, the exaltation of the servant. The whole section is not about the suffering servant, but about the exalted servant. But he suffers to be exalted. That is the key to under, understanding this. Now, the words that are used here to describe his exaltation, notice you have three verbs. He's exalted, he's extolled, and he'll be lifted up very high. This is one of those passages where language is too limiting upon, uh, upon the prophet. He piles these verbs on top of each other to express the ultimate magnitude of what happens. He's, he's not just honored. He's not just glorified. These words are too, too weak. He, he piles these uh, verbs on top of each other to indicate the highest conceivable exaltation. And two of these words are used in other passages in Isaiah as a description of the highest throne in heaven, the throne of God. In Isaiah chapter 6, 1, uh, Isaiah, as he sees God in heaven high and lifted up, 
these are two words that are used here to re- refer to the servant as well. He indicating he's elevated to the level of the throne of Yahweh. In Isaiah fifty-seven fifteen, he's called the high and lofty one. Yahweh sitting upon his throne is the high and lofty one. Same verbiage. So to use these verbs uh, and apply them to the exaltation of the servant here indicates that he's elevated to the level of of the throne of God. This fits with the theology of Psalm 110. Psalm 110 begins with the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. This is the, who is, who are those two lords? Uh, David is the one writing the psalm, and he says, the Lord, that's the speaker, the Lord, which is Yahweh, said to my Lord, so who's in authority? Who is the Lord over David? The Lord over David is not, can't be a human Lord because David is the highest authority in Israel. There's no authority, human authority over David. The only authority over David must be a divine authority. So the my Lord of that statement, indicating the one in authority over, over David, must be uh, on the level with, with God, with deity. And he has said that the first Lord, Yahweh, says to my Lord, sit at my right hand. This is the position of honor at the side of the, of the highest throne in heaven. This is applied to Jesus in the New Testament, and the passage that gives us the greatest picture of the exaltation of of uh, Jesus is in Philippians 2, 9 to 11. <clears throat> For this reason also God highly exalted him. For what reason? Because Jesus humbled himself to the point of obedience and going to the cross. That's the previous verses. Highly, God highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That is a statement of deity, that Jesus Christ is fully God, to the glory of God the Father. So verse 13 of Isaiah talks about his exaltation. Well, verse 14 begins with another very interesting kind of construction, and this is one of those constructions that really took me some time uh, to work through because it's an unusual construction in, in the Hebrew, but it's one of those constructions that involves three comparisons or possibly two comparisons in one contrast or two contrasts and then a comparison. And you have to work through every permutation of each possibility to figure out how it would play out in terms of every word or phrase in in the sentence, so it takes a little while to untangle uh, everything related to this. But um, it starts off with this phrase, just as uh, just as many were astonished at you. And so his visage was marred. So you have just as and then so. And then verse 14 begins with so. So you have this interesting phrase, just as, so, and so. So what's that all about? What does that uh, communicate? So that has to be uh, taken apart. And part of our understanding of that is to understand the identification of the uh, pronouns here, the terms like many, uh, just as many were astonished at you. Who's the you? Who is he uh, speaking of, of in that passage? Just as many, who are the many? Uh, who's the you? Uh, so his visage, notice it shifts from referring to the servant as a second person singular, the you. Now he's talking about the, the, the servant with a third person singular pronoun, his. Confused yet? Just as you, and then he turns as if God is speaking initially to the servant, and then he turns and he's speaking to a different audience, and now he's referring to the servant at his side as in the third person singular, so his visage. So that's, that's the picture that we see here in this scene. So, who, first of all, who are the many? There are those who think that the many refers to, is just a general term, this is pr- probably pretty close, a general, non-specific term referring to all of humanity. 
You have passages such as uh, uh, just the next verse, uh, verse 15, so shall he sprinkle many nations. There the many refer to all of the nations on the earth apart from Israel. So he shall sprinkle many nations. In Isaiah 53, 11, once again, as we come back to the close of chapter 53, when God once again is the speaker, we read, uh, He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servant shall justify many. To whom does that many refer? That refers not just to the Gentiles, but to the Jews as well. So that is a nonspecific term referring to all of humanity. Uh, uh, verse 12 of Isaiah 53, God says at the end of that verse, and he bore the sin of many. Again, a nonspecific uh, pronoun referring to uh, the, the mass of humanity. So it's just referring to an unspecified uh, group of people. These are the people who are observing the, the servant and the, one, the ones who are addressed in um, verse 14. So it begins, Just as many were astonished at you. So that's the first part. And we see there are, there's this group of people that are astonished at what happens to the servant. Now the verb here that's translated astonished is the Hebrew verb shamam which means to be desolate, to be appalled, to be amazed, shocked, aghast, or to be horrified at something. It is as if you are looking at something that is the most appalling, frightening, horrifying thing you have ever seen in your life. You might imagine uh, the, the, the kind of look and attitude that was on the face and in the minds of uh, American soldiers when they first discovered uh, some of the uh, death camps in Germany and in uh, uh, Poland at the end of World War II. Just beyond belief, the, the suffering, the horror that they saw uh, before them, all of the suffering. And so now there's going to be an explanation in the next two clauses in uh, the last half of verse 14 and the first half of 15. They describe two different groups of people. Both are initially appalled as they see what has happened to this this individual. And so the first so reads like this. So his visage was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Now, when we compare that with the JPS version and the Tanakh, we see a similarity, that his visage is, uh, in the JPS version, his visage, which refers to his face, is unlike that of a man, his form unlike that of the sons of men. Uh, The Tanakh version translates, So marred was his appearance, unlike that of man, his form beyond human semblance. So what both the JPS version and the the Tanakh understand this to be that this is translated as if this is an individual. And even if it allegedly refers to the nation, it is beyond description, something that is destroyed beyond description and no longer has the appearance of, that they once had is no longer recognizable. Now, I don't think you can really apply that to the Jewish people, even in light of the Holocaust, because they were still recognizable as the Jewish people afterwards. There were many indeed who suffered, and those who suffered, uh, who lived in Eastern Europe and in Europe as a whole, they came under Nazi domination, uh, suffered terribly, but there were there was already a large Jewish community in uh, in Palestine at that time under under the uh, British mandate. There was a large Jewish community in the United States. There were also Jewish communities in many of the uh, Arab countries. So that the Jewish community, while one part of it was uh, beaten up, as it were, and was marred, 
that was only one part of the Jewish people. It was not the whole. Whereas the image that is presented here is that the entirety of this individual is so disfigured that his humanity is no longer uh, recognizable. The word there that is translated marred is um, the word mishkat. Now, there's some debate about the meaning of this word, which uh, I'll alert you to here, uh, mishkat. And this is the only place where mishkat is used in the entire Old Testament. The technical term for that is it's called the hapax legomenon, a fancy Latin phrase meaning it's only used one time. Since it's not used in uh, any other biblical, uh, there's no other uh, literature that uses biblical Hebrew in the ancient world, we sort of have to guess at those kinds of words, and there's several hundred uh, hapax legomenons in the Old Testament, and you have to guess at those a little bit to see what they mean. It's not, uh, it's not just guessing out of the uh, pure blue, because Hebrew has very close cognate languages in uh, Ugaritic, Akkadian, uh, Arabic, and there are parallelisms in language that give us a pretty good clue as to what these, what these words mean. But you should know that uh, the word, uh, remember as I've told you in Hebrew, even though you don't know Hebrew, uh, that Hebrew is based on roots that are usually three consonants. They didn't have vowels in, in early Hebrew. They just wrote in consonants. And once you, uh, as you take that root word, if you want to use it to mean different things, referring to different individuals, singular, plurals, you add different endings. If you want to make it, uh, make the verb a noun, you'll add an M at the beginning, which makes it a participle. Sometimes that participle becomes uh, solidified as a noun. And so there are different... Um, uh, different prefixes and suffixes that you add to that basic root. And depending on the kind of, I um, already see your eyes glazing over, uh, depending on the kinds of consonants that are inside that three-letter root, it's going to cause your accents to go in different directions and maybe certain letters to drop, fall in or fall out or things like that. So scholars sometimes when they come to a Certain kinds of words that are only used one time, they, they're not real sure what the original root is. And so for centuries, and in fact up until the 20th century, so we're talking about all the way back into the uh, period before Christ and before the New Testament, all the way up until the early 20th century, this has been understood to be the root of, of this word, uh, shakat which means to be disfigured or marred. But there were some scholars around the early 20th century who came along and looked at this and saw that the first three letters were Mame, Sheen, Tav, and that th this is the root of, through the three-letter root for the uh, noun Mashiach, for the anointed one, Mesh Mesh where we get our word Messiah. And so their guess was that <clears throat> uh, shakat is not was not the original root, but Mashiach was, and this should be translated anointed. Now, this is one of the aberrations you'll hear from uh, crazy liberal Protestants, not from, uh, obviously, with looking at the JPS and Tanakh, you won't hear this from a Jewish uh, background person, but you'll hear it from a Protestant liberal that this is the anointed one. And there's a few commentaries and a uh, few scholars who take this view, and often scholars take views like this because they just want to be different. It has to do with academic arrogance, and universities and seminaries are filled with people who just have to be different to be different. And, uh, and so there's, this really isn't adopted by most people. In fact, there are several scholarly studies that have uh, definitively refuted this, but things like this still have a life of their own once they're, once they're stated. So the idea of being disfigured or marred or physically, just so physically tortured and abused to the point of being unrecognizable is the idea here. It talks about two aspects of him. His visage is the word mare which uh, has been translated face or visage, countenance, appearance. 
And there are some scholars who've tried to make a distinction here that this just refers to his face, the other refers to his body, but that's a little, um, th- that's pressing the distinctions a little too far. I think both words refer to his general appearance. They're basically synonymous. And the other word is to R, which means his, his form, his, and both describe his, his person, his appearance, and by, and remember this is written in poetry, so his face or his visage or his countenance, let's say, so let's translate it that way, his countenance was marred more than any man. He is, he is so physically beaten up and de- just, just defaced and, and bruised and beaten and battered that it's more than any human being and he's unrecognizable. And then the next phrase says, and his form more than the sons of men, and more than, and I like the way the Tanakh translates it, beyond human semblance. He, he's not even, he's like he's reduced to something that is less than human by this, by this beating. Now when we go to the New Testament, we see the description that we have in the Gospels of what happened during the uh, trial of Jesus. I want to look at two accounts, one in Matthew and one in, in John. We read in Matthew 27, uh, 26 to 31. Then he, that is Pilate, after going to the crowd, they brought, already brought Jesus before Pilate uh, for the trial. And uh, Pilate <clears throat> is trying to get out from under this weight of having to condemn Jesus. So he takes this, uh, this worst criminal uh, that he has, the head of the... Um, the, the local uh, organized crime, uh, one of the greatest uh, outlaw gangs uh, operating in Judea, uh, named Barabbas, and he says uh, he offers him a choice: release Barabbas or release Jesus. Not thinking that they would want to release this horrible criminal, and instead they choose Barabbas. And so now he has to uh, condemn Jesus, and so he scourges Jesus in verse twenty-seven and then delivers him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him. So all of the Roman soldiers gather around him, and they strip him, and they put a scarlet robe upon him, and then they take this crown of of thorns that they, they make, and they jam it onto his head with these long thorns, and they just jam it down on his head so that it pierces uh, into his skull, and you know, blood is just running down his head. And they put a reed in his right hand, and they mock him. And we're not told in this passage, um, uh, yeah, the next verse. Then they spat on him, and mocked him. Uh, then they spat on him, and took the reed, and they struck him on the head. Well, the the idea here is they continue to just beat him and pummel him. So he's already been been whipped and scourged, and then they are. Uh, beating him and mocking him, and then they put his clothes on him and they led him away to be crucified. Let me tell you a little bit about what the Roman scourging was like. Um, As administered by the Romans, there were three different types of scourging. There was the fustigatio, which was a less severe beating for minor crimes, the flagellatio, which was a flogging, and the worst form was the verberatio, which was a scourging and was the most uh, terrible of all of the uh, punishments by whipping. One writer describes it this way. The delinquent or the criminal was stripped, bound to a post or a pillar, or sometimes simply thrown on the ground and beaten by a number of torturers until they grew tired of beating him and he, they whipped him until his flesh would hang from his bones in bleeding shreds. In the provinces, this, which is Judea, this was the task of soldiers. Three different kinds of implements were customary. Rods were used on freemen. Uh, military punishments were inflicted with sticks. But for slaves, scourges or whips were used, which were comprised of leather thorns, uh, leather thongs, that were fitted with spikes or nails or bones or lead or glass to form a chain. This was the kind of instrument that was used on Jesus. 
so that he is beaten with this whip until the flesh is just hanging off of his bones, and and then he is physically beaten and pummeled until he's uh, he's just a bloody pulp. This is exactly what Isaiah is prophesying, that this servant is is beaten beyond recognition. He doesn't even look human anymore. John said, in the Gospel of John, so then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him, and the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns, put it upon his head, and they put on a purple robe, and then they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and they struck him with their hands. So he is beaten beyond all possible recognition. So when we go back to Isaiah 52, we look at our passage. Just as many were horrified at you. And then there's this extension of that where this next phrase expands on why they were horrified. So his visage was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. So what are we talking about in those phrases? We're talking about his physical suffering before he went to the cross. We're talking about all of the suffering that he goes through uh, prior to his, the actual, um, actual crucifixion where God brought judgment upon sin. So at this point, it's just the physical suffering leading up to the cross. We haven't come to the, uh, the, the, the spiritual suffering for sin. So this first so is an expansion on the just as so, and then it talks about his physical suffering, and then we increase the tone a little bit, and we step it up another notch in verse 15. It begins, so shall he sprinkle many nations. Now this takes us from the physical suffering to the spiritual suffering. Remember, this is not getting into a point-by-point detail, which is what we pick up in Isaiah 53, 1 through 9. This is giving us a summary overview of what 1 through 9 will describe for us. But there's this debate now over what this initial verb means. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Up in, again, up until the late 19th century, this was predominantly translated by the word sprinkle or, or, or spatter. So shall he sprinkle many nations. But as you see in the JPS 1917 version and the Tanakh, it is translated as startled. Now, what's interesting, let me go back. Notice how in the uh, JPS and Tanakh versions, it doesn't translate it as astonished. It translates the word there, shamam, as appalled. It's a very negative thing. There, this, first, this group is appalled and horrified. That is an extremely negative word. But startle isn't a negative word. Startle fits with astonished, not with horrified. So that's the first problem I have, is that if the tone is set by something negative, and the word shamam is used in many passages to relate to the horror with which people view the judgment of God, then appalled is the right translation. But it doesn't fit with this next idea of, of being startled. However, since the early 20th century, more and more scholars have come along wanting to translate this word as, as startled. Now, in our, most of our modern uh, contemporary translations, such as the NIV, the New American Standard Bible, the uh, HCSB, which somebody recently texted me about and said, what's the HCSB? This is the Holman Christian Study Bible put out by Holman Publishing, and that is a fairly recent translation. But they continue to translate this term as sprinkle. Now, these men who translate uh, these, these translations are no dummies. They have excellent education in, uh, in Hebrew, 
and Aramaic, and they have as they're as qualified in the, that field as any rabbi or any Jewish scholar in terms of the basic ling, uh, linguistic education and background and uh, and training. So, what what is the issue here? Well, the issue here is that. For some, as they approach the, the translation here, because they start with the assumption that this is not the an individual, the Messiah, but this is this is the nation that sprinkle somehow doesn't fit the idea. So they started looking to see if there was some secondary meaning somewhere that they could find. So <clears throat> what they did was they discovered that this word that's translated sprinkle, which is uh, nazah, that they uh, suggested that there was a second form of the word, uh, like a homonym. We have homonyms in English where we have words, or a homophone, where we have words that are spelled the same way, but they, uh, or they sound the same way, but they have different meanings. So this would be another word spelled the same way, but it has a, a, a different meaning. And so it's listed in uh, one, of the, uh, one of the Hebrew lexicons as uh, Nazah, Nazah, two, and it is actually listed in uh, lexicon, BDB Brown Driver and Briggs, the last edition I think the one used by most people came out in 1918. Uh, that was the lexicon that I just about wore out going through my second, third, and fourth year of, of Hebrew in seminary. And it is, it, it's excellent, but it was dated because it came out in 1918. There were numerous uh, studies, discoveries, archaeological discoveries, linguistic discoveries that were made between 1918 and the 70s and 80s that caused a number of refinements, changes, modifications, things like that. But BDB was the standard up until the 1990s when it's been replaced by a five-volume work BDB was a one-volume work, about two and a half inches thick. Now it's replaced by a five-volume work that is considered the, the ultimate in Hebrew scholarship, you, referred to by its acronym HALOT, meaning the Hebrew Aramaic Lexicon of the Old Testament. Now the reason I say that is because BDB lists this second form of Nazah, but under it it says in parenthesis Nazah, and then it gives the meaning or before it gives the meaning, it has in parenthesis dubious. And the only citation it has for the meaning of startle is Isaiah 52, 14. So, wait a minute, that seems a little odd that the only place you can find this meaning is here. They identify it as a dubious meaning, but when you come to the 1990s and the publication of Halot, it doesn't even list that secondary meaning at all. And the subsequent lexicon, uh, lexica that have been put out uh, for, in Hebrew don't recognize this as a legitimate meaning. The, tra- the, the interpretive idea was that as the first group is horrified looking at what has happened to the servant, the second group, seeing his exaltation, is surprised by his exaltation. But that really, there, there's the lexicon, lexical data for that just doesn't exist. You can't make up meanings just to fit your theology. You have to go with word usage. And the word usage here for nazah is that it refers ultimately to an act that is ritually or um, literally indicative of a cleansing from sin. It's used that way in a number of passages, uh, and it's used in the Old Testament, as I'll point out in a couple of passages, to obtain, uh, to show ritual purity. It's, according to the theological word book of the Old Testament, its primary significance derives from a reference to blood sprinkling. This particular root is used with blood sprinklings, which are lighter, both as to how much blood is sprinkled and as to what is expiated. And then it gives several references so this is a term that is used for the sacrifice, the covering, the atonement, the forgiveness of sin. Now I'm going to give you, show you some of the references. I want to point something out about this. This is how you do word studies. You look up a word and then you look at how it's used and the things that surround it. Exodus 29, 20, 21. 
part of the Torah. You shall, uh, God says, and you shall take some of the blood that is on the altar and some of the anointing oil and sprinkle it on Aaron. This passage is dealing with the consecration, the uh, uh, anointing of Aaron at the beginning of his ministry. So you sprinkle the blood on Aaron. But there, the text says you sprinkle it. There's an object to the verb. And what you'll see in all of these verses, and all the verses that use the, this verb sprinkle in the Old Testament, always express what is sprinkled. There's always an object, except for Isaiah 52, 15. That's why they raise this issue. There's no mention of a liquid in Isaiah 52, 15. So in Isaiah, uh, Leviticus 4, 6, the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle some of the blood seven times before the Lord. Isaiah, uh, I mean, Leviticus 5, 9, he shall sprinkle some of the blood of the sin offering on the side of the altar. Leviticus 14, 51, he sprinkles the house with the blood seven times. Uh, Leviticus 16, 14, he sprinkles some of the blood on the mercy seat. Uh, Leviticus 16, 19, sprinkles some of the blood on it, the altar with his finger seven times. Numbers 19, 18, he sprinkles it, that is, a clean person shall take hyssop, dip it in the water, and sprinkle the water on the tent, indicating purification again and cleansing. Uh, Numbers 19, 21, sprinkles the water of purification. And then we have a passage that refers to the future time, Ezekiel 36, 25, that I will sprinkle clean water. This is referring to the uh, it, <clears throat> beginning of the, the inauguration of the new covenant uh, in the future messianic kingdom. God says, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean. So what do these all have in common? The sprinkling is, the, is simply a means to state purification. That's the end result. So we look at this verse and we see, so he shall sprinkle many nations. Now, when they came up with this alternate thing, they said, well, let's see if we can find a cognate. Now, you have to be careful with cognates because a cognate may help you, but just because a word is similar in another language, it may have a whole different historical usage development and come up meaning something else. So they found that in Arabic, there was a cognate to this word, a word in uh, (coughs) Arabic from Naza that means to startle. And so they said, that must be the meaning. So if you want to know where the word startle came from, they went over to the cognate in uh, Arabic and said, this one use of Nazah in the Hebrew Old Testament doesn't fit any of the other 20 or so uses of Nazah in the Old Testament. We're, we don't like that. We're going to go pick the meaning from a cousin language from Arabic and bring that in because this avoids the atonement tones of the word sprinkle. Because the word sprinkle, in and of itself, in this summary statement, indicates that what is about to be described is how the nations will be cleansed and purified from sin. And it it doesn't say that per se, but it has that tone because everywhere else the, the word Nazai is used... That's what it. That's what it described. So startle doesn't work because first of all, it's not an attested meaning of the word anywhere else in the scripture. Number two, it doesn't fit the context here at all. It doesn't fit with the concept concept of being appalled or horrified. Back in verse fourteen. <coughs> so for that reason, it's best to conclude that the reason um, for the response of being horrified is the disfigurement of God's servant by by men, and the result of that disfigurement is his spiritual atoning work that takes place on the cross. So that just as at the beginning of verse 14 describes the, the horror expressed by men as they see God's judgment upon the servant, the first group The first so talks about his physical suffering. The second so, so shall he sprinkle many nations, talks about the spiritual aspect of his suffering when he pays the penalty for sin. And the result of this is then expressed in the last part that kings shall shut their mouths at him. 
For what had not been told them, they shall see, and what they had not heard, they shall consider. Now, there's a couple of different ways in which people interpret this. The first is that that they shut their mouths in despair because they are they, they've seen the truth and they're under judgment. The second view is astonishment. And I think it's the second view that they that they are their mouths are shut because they see what God has done in the exaltation of the servant. That this one who was so beaten and so uh, abused physically that he looked like something less than human is raised to a level that elevates him above the angels and above all humanity to something that is superhuman at the right hand of God the Father. And as a result, they are standing in awe as they begin to understand and comprehend the Father's plan of salvation. And that's what is expressed there at the end. So this whole passage is talking about the exaltation of, That's the focal point of the servant. But the servant is exalted, as Philippians 2 says, because he has been obedient to the Father and he has suffered for our sins. This sets up the introduction now for us as we get into the next section, beginning in verse 1 uh, next time, where we see this report that that is laid out from the lips of a future believing remnant who is proclaiming that no one has really listened to them. No one has believed us. No one has has understood the power of God in this and then their explanation of what it was that the servant accomplished. And this goes down to verse 9. We'll begin that next week. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to study this this evening, to uh, see your this magnificent prophecy and to understand how this has been worked out in history and how every detail of this prophecy was fulfilled in the individual uh, Jesus of Nazareth when he was brought before Pilate, when he was uh, beaten and whipped and scourged, when he was taken to the cross, crucified, where he paid the penalty for our sins during that horrible time from 12 noon to 3 p.m. when you brought darkness upon the face of the earth, And he, uh, there was our substitute as your lamb who stood in our place as our uh, substitutionary atonement. And Father, we pray that this might uh, really help us to understand more fully all that was accomplished at the cross that led to his ultimate glorification and exaltation to your right hand even now. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.